Um, he's he's uh, these days into um, beach safety science and then still was back then. He's originally hailed from Canada and I was at the University of Toronto and he came through in like that second phase of uh, Sydney Uni with uh, under uh, Andy Short. And so after that was in Coral Reef Islands for a while. Uh, then at some point um, we worked together on um, escaping from, from rip currents. And as I said more recently, uh, he's, he's developed the uh, beach safety unit at, at UNSW. He's one of the great science communicators. He uh, won the Eureka Prize um, a few years back. And so with that, Rob, I'll throw to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, everyone can see the slide? Yeah? Okay, good. good. Yeah, so this one's a little different. Um, I was interested to see how many people would, would show up for this, but it's... Um, it's really about a new sort of field of research, relatively new, and I'm just going to give you an overview of what I think beach safety research is all about. And there was a bit of a joke behind the title of the talk, because if you're a fan of uh, the book series Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll know that the number 42 is the meaning to the life, the universe and everything. Um, and this talk was actually supposed to be number 42, which I was excited about. But the real title I was going to have was Saving Lives Through Beach Safety Research, because what I'm going to talk about is really how we can keep these people safe. And there's ways to do it from a science perspective, and that involves physical measurements. And this is actually from Jack's PhD field work. But you can also do it by actually talking to people and conducting surveys. So I'm going to go over an overview of what beach safety research is, then talk a little bit about how it's developed over time, and then give you a few case study examples of, of recent projects. So if you want a definition of what beach safety research is, um, this is it. And I know it fairly well because, because I wrote it. So it's probably kind of flawed. But a few years ago, um, the Encyclopedia of Coastal Science was being put together. And I asked Charlie Finkel if I could put in uh, a little mini chapter on beach safety research, because at the time there was a lot of stuff happening and I kind of wanted to, to get it officially recognized. So it's really a mixed methods, multidisciplinary approach that involves both physical and social science methods. And the, the overriding goal is to try and improve understanding of, of anything really related to beach safety. So when I say multidisciplinary, it really is. And, and I say coastal geomorphology because my training was in coastal geomorphology, but involves physical coastal hazards, involves so many different aspects of coastal science, coastal engineering included. Our remote sensing, human behavior, and then you get into fields like ep epidemiology and public health, and there's aspects of science communication and a lot, lot more. So I'm kind of glossing over, but the main thing is it's multidisciplinary. And the important thing about it is it's all about, as all our research is, gathering evidence, okay? So getting evidence-based research that, remember the ultimate goal is to try and keep people safe, that combines physical factors. So understanding the connections between beach morphology, hydrodynamic processes such as waves, tides, rip currents, and other environmental controls such as say atmospheric weather conditions, and trying to link that somehow to the people. So it involves a linkage between physical and social factors where you might have to go out and find information about the demographics of people who are on the beach and using the beach, their swimming ability, how often they visit the beach, you know, what is their behavior when they get to the beach? Do they, they swim between the flags? Do they go with these lifeguards? What do they actually understand about various um, beach hazards? And there's also elements of trying to work out exposure to risk. So, and that's by how often they go and how many people on a beach, et cetera, et cetera. And it also extends into other things. So on beaches, we have things in place to keep people safe, such as in Australia, the pair of red and yellow flags. There's also plenty of examples of, of warning signs and danger signs around but do people pay attention to them? And it also involves elements of how can we improve uh, beach safety education to any age group? And how do we commu communicate information about beach safety to people? And that also involves evaluating what we're actually doing to try and keep people safe. So it's, it's a very broad field. Now, why is it important? Well, I'll just start off with a, a bit of a story about how I got in involved in this. So my background was coastal geomorphology, as I mentioned, and my PhD was on the morphodynamics of rip currents. And that's what I did. I, I, I did field measurements of, of rip current flow. And my first academic job was at the Victoria University in Wellington. 
in the late 90s. And while I was there, we went on holiday to the Coromandel Peninsula in the North Island of New Zealand. And this beach, hot water beach, is famous because at low tide you get natural hot springs bubbling up. And it's famous because people will bring shovels, dig a hole, have a little jacuzzi. It's great. So we showed up and it was a beautiful day. And it's not normally like this. It was quite unusual to be this flat calm. But I took this picture to show my students that even though the waves were quite small, well, very small, in the presence of rocks, you can still get a gentle rip current. And if you see this sort of a bumpy surface there, where it's smooth here and smooth here, that was your rip current. So I took the picture. And then I turned around and I took pictures of the signs they had at warning people about rips, because normally this beach looks like that. This is a picture from a few years ago, the lifeguard sent me, there's the same rock, and you've got a rip current going out here, a rip current going out here. It's a bit of a death trap because you've got tons and tons of tourists going to this beach that is normally very rip prone. So we went for a swim further down the beach and, and we heard some shouts and we swam out and we got to this young, young guy who was holding an older man who had clearly drowned. And I was a lifesaver at the time, it was the first time I'd been in that situation, but we got that person to the beach as, as fast as we could. And there was a lot of doctors around who were tourists and they did CPR and they couldn't save him. And as it turns out, he was, uh, he was a, a German senior citizen. He was there with his grandkids. And we just thought, how did this happen? Um, because it was a beautiful day. And the creepy thing was when I got my pictures developed uh, a few weeks later, that was the man who drowned. So as it turns out, he couldn't swim. He drifted offshore and just panicked and drowned. And for me, that was a game changer because I thought, how does that happen? How can you drown uh, on a day like that in a rip current? And a few things occurred to me. One is that these signs were of no use at all. Um, there, that was, there was actually a German version and he was from German. But I just thought if he had had a little bit of knowledge about what was going on, you know, he was stuck in a rip current and maybe what he should have done, that should have been avoided. So. For me, I sort of thought, well, I've got this knowledge as a scientist. And, you know, you'd always write in, in the national benefit part of your research grants, well, my research is great because my research is about rips and it's going to save lives. And I started thinking, well, is it? Because I'm not really getting this knowledge out to people. And when I got back to Australia the next year, I started off this community education program called the Science of the Surf, which was all about educate, educating people about beach safety and rips. And that was really the start of, of, of getting interested in beach safety and thinking, well, I think my research can have a much better impact than just basic science, not that there's anything wrong with basic science. And um, about 10 years later, I went to the first international symposium on, on rip currents and, and gave one of the keynotes. And I put together this diagram and I, I wasn't sure what talk they were expecting. They were probably expecting me to talk about my physical research, but I wanted to talk about people. And my theory or idea was that sort of beach safety research or at that time rip current research was really about these disconnects. So here you've got scientists and it could be coastal scientists, rip current scientists, beach safety scientists, whatever, who have all this knowledge. How good are we at giving that knowledge to beach safety practitioners and organizations, the people who are responsible for putting lifeguards on beaches and educating the public? And at the same time, how good are these organizations at thinking, well, researchers can help us? Now, traditionally, there wasn't much interaction between the two. This has got a lot better over the years. I mean, uh, Sydney University through Andy Short, as you'll see in a second, has been doing it for a long time. Plymouth University in the UK with the RNLI have been doing it. It's happening a lot, but it can always be improved. And these disconnects need to be fixed. And then you've got another disconnect because ultimately it's the role of the beach safety organizations to impart safety messaging and education to beachgoers to keep people safe. Now, are they doing it correctly? Are they giving the right information about beach hazards to beachgoers? And at the same time, are people responding to that? Are people being motivated by that information to do the right thing? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And then the final disconnect is because there's, there's not a lot of examples of coastal scientists who deal directly with the public. That's improving again, um, because science communication is becoming a big thing. Um, so this is about 10 years old, but, but at the same time, beachgoers, the average person isn't gonna look up journals, right? They're not, they're not gonna have access to the latest journal on rip current research. So my thinking was that if we tackle all of these disconnects, that's the, probably the best way holistically to try and reduce the amount of beach drowning and injury that's going on. So the ultimate goal of beach safety research is really 
to improve all the understanding of beach safety issues, but really try and come up with outcomes and findings that will help in the future development of public safety interventions, public education campaigns, and ultimately the ultimate goal is to try and save lives and reduce injury. And now I'll come back to that at the end of this talk. So in terms of the history of this field of study, it's interesting, um, you know, arguably it could have originated with Professor Andy Short, you know, who, who has done so much for Australian coastal geomorphology over the years, because Andy had a very close relationship and still does with Surf Life Saving Australia. And it really started in the early, late eighties, early nineties, which is around the time I got to Australia and started working with him as my PhD, from my PhD. But Andy basically went around Australia with uh, four surf life saving, you know, taking measurements of every beach, sediment samples, assessing wave conditions, rip currents, mapping, rip current locations, beach type, all that sort of stuff. And from a safety point of view, the, that information was incorporated in what was called the Australian Beach Safety and Management Plan, ABSAMP, with surf life saving. And the sort of tangible output was this beach hazard rating guide for your sort of microtidal beach states, but also your, your um, beach states that ref, uh, incorporate tide. And basically it was a hazard rating that said beaches are either least hazardous, so they get a one, or they're extremely hazardous and they get a rating of 10. And that was based pretty much on a lot of subjective stuff, uh, on water depth, on the shore break conditions, presence of rips, rips and big waves. And this is in color, unfortunately, but it, it was a matrix. Now, this was sort of introduced in this great little paper. Here's Andy about to do a rip float where you chuck in, this is at Mirawai, New Zealand, you throw yourself in a rip and off you go. And um, this is a sleeper paper in terms of beach safety research. If you ever get a chance, this was hidden in a special issue of Journal of Coastal Research. This is a great paper. It's packed with lots of good info. I encourage people to read it if you like this sort of thing. But this eventually ended up manifest with Surf Life Saving in their Beach Safe website and app. Now, I'm not going to go there, but Beach Safe is their public facing portal for how dangerous is your beach. And if you have the Beach Safe app and you use it, it will tell you what beaches you're close to and it will tell you whether they're patrolled. It will tell you their hazard rating and why it's dangerous. OK, so it has a fairly large and potentially significant outreach and input. And in terms of more beach safety research, aside from Andy's early 90s stuff, a lot of it's been rip current focused. And this is a diagram out of um, Bruno Castell led a paper that Jack was on and I was on and Tim Scott, uh, which is basically a review of rip current types and circulation and hazard. And we put together this graph of all the papers that have been done on rip currents. And what this really shows is that most of the papers were science-based. Not many were based on the, the hazard that rips represent until the 2010s. So in the last 10 years, there's been a huge increase, increase an interest in rip currents as a hazard. And these different papers that are out there have looked at stuff like flow circulation patterns of rips and their implications to how you should get out of a rip, which was part of what um, Jack did for his PhD and did some awesome stuff. A lot of social science uh, studies where people have done surveys of beachgoers to find out what they know about rips and how aware they are and their ability to identify them. There's been studies done of surveys of people who've been caught in rip currents to learn from them about what we should be telling people about what to do in rip currents. And there's been studies about rip current signage, how effective are they and various public education strategies, are they working? So rip currents kind of led the way, but it's, it's not just about rip currents. Beach safety research, if you get into this field and it could be, you know, it could be, I'm not even talking about things like tsunami, there's a huge scope for this. But if you want to get into this, you first have to identify the nature and the extent of the problem. So you kind of want to find out, you know, who is drowning, who is getting injured, where is this happening, when is it happening, how is it happening? And to do that, and the what and the why, but to do this, you need data. You need good data of drowning incidents in a region or across a country. And that data, it doesn't always exist. It's, in fact, it's rare that you get a good data set like that. We are kind of lucky in Australia in the sense that Surf Life Saving Australia has done a very good job since 2004 of documenting all coastal drowning. So we can look at temporal trends of the numbers of people drowning along the coast. Um, and you can see that it's been up and down and hasn't really improved. We can map out the locations of where these drownings are happening. We can look at the demographics of the people who are drowning. And we know that most of the coastal drownings are male. We know that there's specific age groups that, are, that tend to drown more than others. 
And we know that most people tend to drown through swimming and rating, uh, wading, which is mostly rip current related. This is all useful material that you need because you need this evidence base. Because if you're going to approach somebody for funding and say, well, well, well why do we need funding to, to solve this drowning problem? They're going to want numbers. And you have to provide those statistics. So any decent beach safety project has to start off with this and as your baseline. And, if, and you're seeing this more and more that different countries, China, um, Turkey, Iran, Malaysia, there's all these papers coming out talking about the number of people drowning on their beaches, just giving the stats. But it's not just about rips. As I mentioned, there's been a lot of work on surf zone injuries. These are spinals and dislocations, impact injuries that happen on beaches. And the first paper that did that was Jack Paleo on the east coast of the US. Um, it's not hard to see why people get injured. And these injuries are significant. You know, there's a lot of paraplegia and quadriplegia involved, and that involves lifelong medical costs aside from the emotional costs. So it's a big, big deal. And there's been a lot of attempts to try and link these surf zone injuries with environmental conditions. So this is where the physical side comes in, the beach slope, the wave conditions. And Bruno Castell has followed this um, in studies in France. And the basic finding is we haven't really found a good environmental control yet, but I'll get back to that with one of my case studies. Rock fishing is another area of interest. And I know that's not really beach related, but kind of is. So a lot of work has been done at the University of Melbourne with David Kennedy with Surf Life Savings. So David mapped out a lot of rock platforms in Victoria, kind of came up with a hazard index for those rock platforms from a geomorphological perspective, because um, rock fishing is dangerous and involves um, being very close to the edge on rock platforms that vary considerably in their geomorphology. But at the same time, there was a, a student, a human geographer, who actually went and talked to rock fishers about their perceptions of the hazard and how they, you know, what, how they react when waves are big and what their, what their knowledge is. So it's that combination of the physical and the social that's important. Bystander rescues is a big deal. So I had a student years ago who looked at surfers doing rescues and found, she found that surfers do probably as many rescues as lifeguards and that most of them felt that they had saved a life. Um, and that has had implications towards the development of what's known as the surfers 24 seven rescue program in Australia where surfers are, are given a free course to uh, learn how to enact a rescue using their board and a bit of CPR. And bystander rescues is becoming a big deal globally because too often, forget about surfers, it's people on the beach who rush in to save somebody, often a family member, and they drown in the process. So there's been a lot of research on bystander rescues and, and all of the data is sort of showing, you know, we've done surveys of people who've done bystander rescues, we've looked at the data no one is using flotation devices when they go in to make these rescues. Almost all the people who have drowned did not grab a flotation device. So a simple message is coming out of that research is that we need to promote, if you see somebody in trouble, grab a flotation device. Uh, Chris Hauser, um, who's based at uh, University of Windsor now, he's a coastal geomorphologist by training who's very much into beach safety research. He's thinking outside the box and is looking at the psychology of beach users. And he's really interested in this thing called confirmation bias, which is this idea that you go to a beach, there's a rip current, but you wanna go for a swim, and let's assume you know nothing about rips. Well, you might not go swimming because there's no one in there. But if you throw a few people around, and these were his students, even in the rip, you're gonna go, oh yeah, it's okay. Um, there's people in the water, it must be okay. So there's all this psych psychological element of working out how do we keep people safe. And I've mentioned it before, I'm just mindful of going talking too long, but. There have been studies of beach signage that have basically shown that people don't pay attention to beach signage, just like they usually don't pay attention to many signs in general because of signage pollution. And they're not near as effective as, as authorities assume they are. You have to have signs, but the question is what's gonna work? What's gonna make a difference? And this is just on the South Coast, of New South Wales, walking past here, what are you gonna look at? Anything? There's actually a little rip current sign here that's quite nice, but very small. And then there's multimedia. We use multimedia, especially on social media, to get a lot of safety information out to people. Is it working? So there's studies that have done that. This is just a fun one that I had a student look at the impact of watching Bondi Rescue. And you think, oh, that's a joke. Um, but it's not because a lot of people watch Bondi Rescue globally. And she did this amazing study that involved a survey of, of people on, you know, watch Bondi Rescue and had thousands of responses. And and there's people overseas in all sorts of different countries who now know the importance of swimming between the red and yellow flags and the rip currents are a big deal and what you should do and et cetera. They're not gonna get that knowledge when they jump on the plane. 
to come to Australia. They're not going to get that knowledge when they land in Australia. Probably not going to get that knowledge, period. So don't discount things like multimedia. And, you know, we've had studies, there's been various studies look at different types of coastal hazards and how they're portrayed on YouTube, if that information is correct. So there's tons and tons of stuff. And one of the advantages of doing, I've found, doing beach safety research is that there's always an outcome, or there always should be an outcome, that is tangible, that can help people. And, and that's pretty rewarding. And the other thing that's exciting, I find, is that it's new. There's so much to be done, right? And as an academic, it's exciting when you feed off of this, right? It's there's so much to be done, and, and it's all important. So Jack said, um, give a couple of case studies, and he said, do three. And I got carried away, so I'm giving you four. So I'll go through these pretty quick, all right? Um, the first one, these are recent studies that I've been involved with, so I know them. This one is literally hot off the press. I've just sent off the proofs today. It's, it's a study by um, a German intern student who I had who, who was amazing. And, and it's called Characteristics of Beach Safety Knowledge of Beachgoers and Unpatrolled Surf Beaches in Australia. Why we did this was because most drownings occur on unpatrolled beaches where there's no lifeguards. And that's, that's pretty global. Um, but existing studies of beachgoers that involve surveying people to find out what they know has been done on patrol beaches in the presence of lifeguards and flags and all that stuff. So we said, well, let's go to the source of the problem. Let's go to unpatrolled beaches and talk to people and find out who's going on patrol beaches and why. And try and see, is there any particular risk factors of these people compared to everybody else? Now, of interest, this was funded by a New South Wales Government Water Safety Fund, and Mitch Harley was on that because his role was the physical side. So I was going to do the beach surveys of people, and he installed a lot of low-cost cameras that Chris Drummond talked about in a recent one of these seminars to basically monitor the rip current location. This is um, Mary Beach in the south coast, one of our beaches, but also to do beach counts. Um, and Chris Drummond gave an amazing talk. So there was a physical side of this as well. So what we did, we picked uh, beaches at different locations. So we did Dreamtime Beach, which is just the very tip of northern New South Wales that is a beautiful beach. Instagram darling, people go there all the time. There's a massive rip and there's been five people drowned there in the last few years, at least pre-COVID. So we wanted to capture people who go to a beach that, you know, that are driven by social media. Turrimetta Beach in Sydney is a rare beach in Sydney that's a surf beach that's also on patrol. So we wanted to capture locals. And then we went to the south coast of New South Wales, which is very heavily visited by, by domestic tourists. So we wanted to get different demographic groups and survey them, as we did here. So we got a lot of surveys done. And I'm just skimming through the results here. 65%, two thirds of the people going to these unpatrolled beaches are infrequent beachgoers. Almost half identify as being average, weak, or non swimmers. They're almost, they almost all know there's no lifeguards, yet they're, they're almost all going to go into the water, right? So it's really no surprise that people are drowning in unpatrolled beaches, and then they're recommending these beaches to others. Now, the main thing we wanted to get out of this was, well, why are you going to the beach? We kind of knew this already, right? Um, but we, we needed evidence. And by far, the main reason they picked these beaches, they wanted a quiet location. You know, they, they wanted to get away from people, and, and why not? But they still wanted to go swimming. And a lot of them wanted to go to a beach that was close to their accommodation and where they lived. So it's unrealistic to assume, like, you hear all these messages when there's a drowning on, a, on an unpatrolled beach. The message that comes out on the media is, is, oh, we must swim between the flags. Well, it's just unreasonable to expect somebody who's paid a lot of money for coastal accommodation to hop in their car. They're on a beach. They're not going to hop in a car and drive 25 kilometers to find a patrolled beach. It's not going to happen. Um, we, there was lots of signs up at these beaches and on the south coast, only 25%, uh, 26% actually noticed them, let alone understood what was on them. And at the other beaches, it was about half. And that's because some of these signs were just massive. Um, two thirds of the people we surveyed said they knew what a rip current was and what it did. But, or sorry, of the people who said they knew what a rip current did, only about two thirds actually understood what rips did. So there's this overconfidence. And then we tested the rip spotting ability, which is a big theme in beach safety research. You show them pictures, which has its flaws. And we used all these pictures from previous studies. And although 70% said, yeah, 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 I can spot a rip. When they were given these six choices, almost half scored low. So they got two right or less. So that's a typical theme. People think they can spot rips, but they can't. So the, the takeaway message from this one is, and this is really important, is that 
we have to move beyond in Australia, the swim between the red and yellow flags message. It drives me crazy after every drowning, this is what comes out, right? And in some ways it's kind of useless because we know we should, but people don't. And I think we need to accept that and move and keep it, but move on. And Surf Life Saving has this nice think, land, think line campaign where you're supposed to think about beach safety when you go to the beach, stop, have a think, look around, plan if you get in trouble, which is great except nobody's heard of it. So this is the sort of thing that needs to be promoted in a big, big way. Um, and that in the beach safety world has big ramifications. The next case study is one that was just published in early January. Uh, one of my honor students from last year, identifying risk factors and implications for beach drowning prevention amongst an Australian multicultural community. This idea came about because where I live, um, south of Sydney, there's a big Hindu temple nearby. Um, people go to the temple and then they come to a local beach called Stanwell Park, which is extremely dangerous beach. It's not uncommon. There's been there's, you know, multiple drownings over the years, mostly of the Southern Asian community. So that's Indian, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lankan. So aside from that, if you look at the drowning stats since 2004, almost 50% of all the coastal fatalities in Australia are people born overseas. And that Southern Asian community is highly represented within that group. And multicultural communities are interesting because they're different. They, they have different cultures. They have different languages. They have different risk factors. Um, and yet no study has addressed their beach safety. Nothing, zero, hasn't, hasn't been done. So the idea was to try and pick a particular community and try and identify risk factors related to their demographics, where they live, their age, gender, their swimming ability, what they understood about beach beaches and, and, and what they did at beaches. So Mark did a really good job. He went to a local temple, this temple I mentioned, and surveyed people. He also did online surveys. And, you know, again, I'm glossing over this, but 80% of these people surveyed had poor swimming ability. Most of them often swam in the absence of lifeguards. More than half had no clue whatsoever about rip currents, no knowledge, didn't know what they were. And most of them would enter the water when they visited the beaches. So, you know, they're, they're going to the beach, maybe not every day, but they're visiting the beach fairly frequently. A lot of times, because I said they go to the temple, then they go to the beach. And most of the time when they go to the beach, they go in the water. But the kicker is that almost a third had not heard of, and had not heard of or did not understand the purpose and meaning of the red and yellow flags. That is huge because in Australia, that's our platform for keeping people safe. And you're saying that a third of this multicultural community are not getting this message. Something isn't working. And a lot of them thought that the red in the flag meant danger, keep away. So this is strong evidence. And then we found, we found that the most important factor for risk factor was length of time living in Australia, because most of these people were, were migrants. Age, didn't really matter in terms of whether they were knowledgeable or not, neither to gender, but their length of time in Australia was important. Those who had lived less than 10 years in Australia tend to visit beaches more frequently. They're less likely to swim, be able to swim, I mean, had, have had swimming lessons, heard of the flags, or seen any beach safety information. They're the ones at risk. And then we ask, well, where have you seen previous beach safety information? And mostly they said social media and signs, but there's a big push in, in, in the beach safety industry, I went, I went to a symposium years ago on multicultural beach safety. And the main message was that we need to promote beach safety from within the community. So there needs to be champions within their community to educate them and, and motivate them to about beach safety in an effective and, and culturally appropriate way. That seems to be the way we're going. Yet only 3% of people said they had received any information from their community. When we asked them, how would you like to receive information? hardly any said from their own community. So there's a big disconnect there. So the big picture there is that we have to improve multicultural beach safety education and also teaching new migrants to swim. New migrants are definitely, definitely high at risk. Um, it's an interesting sidebar. I'm working at the moment with a linguist from uh, University of South Australia, who's just done his own survey of beachgoers, new migrants from a range of different backgrounds. Literal translation is important. We tell people swim between the red and yellow flags. We may translate that into different languages. He's finding that people are taking it literally and they're saying, well, I can't swim. Therefore, I can't swim there because they're telling me to swim between the red and yellow flags. I've got to go in the water somewhere else, which is the sort of stuff you just don't think about. It's just, but it's mind blowing. 
So it's important. And just as a side, and this is for science communication, you know, we did a media release for the study that generated a potential reach of 3.2 million people through news, television news and radio. And it doesn't say that 3.2 million people listened to it, but they could have. And, and it's important, that's another aspect of this is to promote this widely. Okay, I'll try to be quick here. Case study three, surf zone injuries in New South Wales. I mentioned that there's been some work done on the surf zone injuries in the States and also France, but nothing in Australia. So I had an honor student, Alva Lane, last year do a project on this. She got a data, great database from Surf Lake, uh, Surf Lake Saving Australia, and she focused on New South Wales. And she found that since 2004, and she focused only on spinal injuries and dislocations that occurred at the beach, but they didn't, things that didn't involve surf craft or boats. So this is like impacts with, with the beach. Um, and that's a lot of in, uh, incidents over that time. And it's all across the coast. And the top four beaches were, three of them were in Sydney, not no surprise because so many people go there, but Coogee Beach, if you know Coogee is a quite a steep reflective beach, um, had the most, 12% of all these cases, Bondi had a lot, Cronulla had a lot, Byron Bay had a lot. And funnily enough, Byron Bay is, is a big tourist destination. But though after that, it dropped off a lot. But most of these incidents, no surprise, occur in summer, January, and on Sundays, mostly males, not as much as males are represented in drowning statistics. There's a lot of females getting injured as well. Most commonly in the young group, which is a worry, and most under the age of 25. This is all maybe not surprising, but it's all important evidence. If you're going to develop an education campaign, this is telling you who you need to target and when. And then Alva wanted to try and relate those occurrences with physical parameters, right? which is hard, um, but she basically mapped out these incidents based on the beach type, which is basically from this ABSAMP and, and basically Andy Short's modal beach state characterization of every beach. And half occurred on trans earth bar rib beaches. Now we tend to associate steep beaches, reflective beaches, that's where you're gonna get a nasty shore break, that's where you're gonna get hurt. Not so, it occurs on, on all sorts of intermediate beach types. She looked at medium beach slope from COSAT, Killian Voss's COSAT, found no relationship um, most occurred on the falling tide, most at intermediate water depths. She looked at offshore wave records and, and, and basically they occurred during normal wave conditions. But this sort of stuff is inherently flawed. There's huge limitations because we're dealing with modal beach states, medium beach slopes. It's impossible at the moment to know the actual location of these incidents. Was it at the shore break? Was it on a sandbar? It's just not in the database. And, and we also don't know what the actual conditions were. So no study is yet to really link environmental controls sufficiently. But this is big. This is what came out of this paper that we're or study that we're working on. The existing beach hazard rating guide, right, does not really factor in the danger and importance of surf zone injuries because most happen on beaches with hazard ratings less than six, which is moderately hazardous or least hazardous. So what it's really telling us and these are serious injuries. We need to rethink this hazard rating, right? It needs, we need to improve it. And, and yeah, I think that's a pretty significant finding. All right, last one. Um, this is interesting. So I've got a great PhD student, William Kuhn, lifeguard from California. Uh, he's been involved in drowning prevention for a long time. We did a survey years ago of lifeguards because data that lifeguards collect is absolutely gold for what we do because it gives us information on the type of rescues, where the rescues occur, when it occurs. And we can relate that to physical factors like wave height and all those things, beach type, blah, blah, blah. The problem is data collection by lifeguards is notoriously inconsistent and variable. And that's a big barrier to what we do. But no one had actually done a study on this. So we did a survey of lifeguard chiefs around the world to find out what data they collect to identify gaps. So we basically targeted, like I said, people in charge of the lifeguards, so the chiefs. And it was promoted through an organization called the International Drowning Researchers Alliance, which is, has links around the world. And we got a decent response, 55, 12 countries. That was okay, mostly from the US and Australia. But we asked some questions about how their lifeguard service works, how they collect data related to weather and ocean data, what their lifeguards do, and their opinions on various things. And no surprises, we found that their, their methods vary considerably. You've got different lifeguards recording conditions from day to day. So that's all sorts of error associated with that. They're doing visual estimates, all sorts of error. Um, 
they're basically collecting all sorts of different types of stuff. Some collect weather, some don't, some do this, some don't. So it's quite variable. You know, knowing how many people on a beach is a big deal as well, because we want to look at exposure and risk and all that sort of stuff. But this is where we get the data from, and it's, it's mostly visual. So it's probably garbage, most of that data. Um, there's often rescue details are lacking. So 58% of these lifeguard services record the cause of the rescue. Otherwise, it just goes down as rescue, which is hopeless because it was it a rip current. Was it somebody in deep? What was going on? Um, you can't do anything if you don't have that, that rescue detail. And is it even accurate? Well, I mentioned visual estimates, estimates, but we asked lifeguards, the chiefs, how correct do you think the data is that these lifeguards are getting? And some of them thought it was good, but a lot of them thought it wasn't so good. And then we asked them, how important is collecting the data? And they pretty much said, yeah, it's pretty important. Um, how, how, how do you think your lifeguards treat this? And do they uh, take it seriously or not? Well, it's a real mix of responses. And if you ever do work with lifeguards, you're, it's hit or miss. You can either get a lifeguard service that is really switched on, really motivated, really into helping, or you get, I won't mention any names, but you get some who just don't care. And it's impossible and it's so, so frustrating. So the outcome of this one, what, there was amongst these lifeguard chiefs a strong need and desire to start standardizing data collection. So everyone's collecting the same thing in the same way and also increase the use of technology to improve data collection. And if you're interested, there was our beach safety research group did run a uh, beach safety technology conference last year that's on our website and you could listen to all the talks and it was pretty much about this. And, and as I mentioned, beach County before for Chris Drummond and the WRL at uh, UNSW, they're doing some amazing stuff at beach County and because it's important. Okay, so just to wrap up, if you want to get into beach safety research or coastal safety research or anything related to this, do it. It's, it's fun, it's incredibly rewarding, it's exciting, but it's a whole new world. For me, being a coastal geomorphologist and a physical scientist by training, it's, been a, it's, it's learning a lot of new things and getting used to a lot of new stuff. And, and the same things apply, it's hard to get data, right? Some of the data doesn't exist and, and the quality of data varies and getting data can be difficult. Dealing with questionnaires and surveys, I thought it'd be easy. You just go ahead and ask people questions, put something online. It's not easy at all. And there's all sorts of bias. You know, people tick things because they think they should. And there's a million different biases with surveys. Then you've got your language cultural issues. So you want to, you know, for us, you want to target everyone on the beach, not just English speakers. But so that means you've got to translate these surveys. You've got to find somebody who can speak that language and approach these people. And you've got to make sure they've been translated in, in a meaningful way. And then journal selection. It's hard, like, you know, I'll send papers off to natural hazards and they'll say, no, nah, there's too much social stuff in this. So I send it to a sort of a social journal or a safety journal. Now nah, there's too much physical stuff in this. So it's, it's tricky, but by and large, ethics is the worst thing ever. You know, if you think it's bad doing risk assessments to go into the field, to do your measurements, no, 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 no. Ethics is worse, it's horrible. But the overall th thing of doing this is, is beach, safe, uh, beach safety research saving lives. Good question, right? You like to think so, but most of these papers end up with recommendations saying, well, we should be putting more emphasis in teaching people how to spot rips, or we should be doing this, but we don't know if it's being followed up, but sometimes it is. So I've mentioned Jack McCarroll's research when he was doing, looking at rip escapes and that the results of testing rip escape strategies made Surf Life Saving Australia change their whole public education about rip currents, about what they should do when they get stuck in a rip. And they're now promoting know your options. Rather than just saying, do one thing, you've got options to float or to swim or whatever. Subsequently, in the US, NOAA and the National Weather Service totally revamped their core graphic behind their rip current education program to copy what, we, what Surf Life Saving did. Is that saving lives? I don't know, but it's an example of a pretty significant outreach impact of the type of research that we do. So that's it. I mean, I was going to shamelessly promote the UNSW Beach Safety Research Group. You can, we've got a fancy new website. It looks pretty slick. I don't do it. My PhD student Will does. But we love working with anybody. We're open to working with anybody. We've got a lot of projects going on. We've got a bazillion ideas. As usual, we need more funding and we need PhDs. So if you know anyone, student or whatever, that might be interested in this or you're interested in it, just, just get in contact with us. We'd love to work with you. So that's it. I went over. Sorry, Jack. Uh, that's great. Thanks.